so my story started, my cancer story started back in 1994 when I was diagnosed with cervical cancer and completely out the blue, was not expecting it to be uh, cancer. I had been under a gynecologist who'd been screening me, but apparently he hadn't been doing it correctly. And quite a lot of women actually fell through the gaps and they're about well, there's a recall of over a thousand women because of his errors. And unfortunately, I ended up being one of those. Um, so by the time they discovered that it was cancer, it had spread to quite a, a number of my lymph nodes. And so in most cases, that would be described as a stage three. For me, they uh, described it as a stage one B because that's how they determine it with cervical cancer just depending on where it's spread so i thinking that it was stage 1b and not really doing enough research at the time silly me i kind of rested on my laurels a little bit just stuck with the traditional treatments and then my mother in 1996 got a recurrence of her breast cancer and that really shocked me woke me up to the fact that actually I was only, sta I, I was stage three and that actually stage four was only a short hop away from me. Um, and I started researching very much for my mother to try and save her. And unfortunately, she didn't have much time left. And, you know, I, it was very hard for me to access any treatments in Guernsey. Little Island um, to, to try and get her any any kind of help. So uh, unfortunately, she passed away and that was a, a massive shock to me. Woke me up to all of these other treatments that were out there, like intravenous vitamin C, like changing your diet, the effect of meat, dairy on IGF-1. Uh, all of that I suddenly became aware of, whereas I hadn't had a clue. So I started cutting out a lot of things in my diet. I started changing up a lot of what I did, uh, but unfortunately it didn't stop the fact that the cancer then came back in my lungs. Um, so I was then deemed stage four. I then went through six months of chemo um, and and that was really worrying. I mean, I'd already had chemo and radiotherapy before, and I'd had quite a lot of that for the first time I got cancer. So uh, additional doses of chemo, and they gave me very heavy dose. Um, and that unfortunately then led to a problem later on. So a few years after that, I then ended up with something called myelodysplasia, which is a problem in the bone marrow, which can then go to, uh, to, to be uh, acute myeloid leukemia um, very quickly. Fortunately, I picked it up with some blood tests um, and uh, we started treating that straight away. But I didn't want to have more chemo at that point. You know, that was the last thing I wanted to do. So I'd already changed my diet. I've been doing things like intravenous vitamin C, but it seemed that that still wasn't enough to stop this next cancer. I've been keeping one cancer under control, but this other cancer seemed to be far more tricky to control than the other one. So um, I knew I had to up my game and that's where I started diving more into the research. I'd already done a whole load and PubMed was becoming, you know, rather familiar to me. At this point, I'd learned lots of terminology that I hadn't understood before. I was kind of becoming my own patient oncologist, if you know what I mean. And I was learning all the terminology, the pathways and this was when I realized that I probably had to starve the cancer in order to stop it from growing. And some of the things I chose in my cocktail included off-label drugs. And by that, I mean drugs that are not normally used for cancer or oncology. And I used old drugs that have been shown to have anti-cancer effects. But I picked a cocktail that kind of blocked off some of the um, access that the, the cancer has to nutrients. So I blocked glucose is obviously, everybody seems to know that glucose is a big factor when it comes to uh, cancer. And I had selected a supplement that I didn't know anybody else was using back then. In fact, I don't think anybody else knew about it at all. I'd, I'd come across an article in a Chinese herbal um, magazine about berberine 
and it sounded amazing and sounded exactly the kind of thing I needed to be taking to block cancer's access to glucose. So that was as part of my cocktail already and I've been using that alongside the chemo and I had a, an amazing result with my chemo. My oncologist hadn't expected it to work quite as well as it did um, and I'd managed to get her to cut down some of the dosage as well because I also felt that I was being overdosed with it um, and I, I managed to talk her out of giving me the maximum tolerated dose because I was a bit worried about that. Um, but anyway, I was I was already on berberine as part of my cocktail. I then added a drug called dipridamol, which is an antiplatelet drug, and that helps block. Um, I didn't know about its blocking effect on a cholesterol pathway, but it does help block something called nucleoside um, transport. So that's the uptake of little chunks of DNA to help fuel. The, the growth of these new daughter um, cancer cells. They need chunks of DNA for their, for their for the nucleus to make a new nucleus for the daughter cell. So this is something I thought would help block that and starve the cancer of that. Uh, I also found research showing that lovastatin and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory together worked five times better than just using a statin on its own or using uh, the non-steroidal on its own. So I persuaded my oncologist to prescribe me this cocktail of lovastatin and etodilac, which is normally given for arthritis. And this was, again, something she'd never done before. Um, and in fact, I think oncologists now are terribly scared about prescribing off-label drugs. It's kind of not part of their protocol and, and they feel like they're gonna get a wrist slap if they do. So. Um, I, I, I'm very glad that I had the oncologist that I did and that she was prepared to look beyond the fact that I was just doing the traditional stuff and was um, very willing to prescribe these things to me because otherwise I don't think I'd be sitting here today. I really don't. So um, so that was the main thrust of, of what I was doing. Um, and then I discovered metformin later on. I discovered... Um, Sometidine or Tagamet, which you can get over the counter. This is really good for helping to um, switch your immune system back on, I discovered. I mean, this was during a period of uh, when there was a lot of bird flu around in the UK. And I was a bit worried because my immune system didn't seem to be coping very well at the time. I didn't know, but I've also got cystic fibrosis only discovered that just before lockdown for COVID. Uh, something I've had all my life and maybe made me more susceptible to cancer, I really don't know. But, um, you know, I did have my cancer as a, at a very young age. So maybe, maybe it was part of the problem, I don't know. But anyway, um, so my immune system has always been a bit dodgy, or I thought so, because my lungs would never feel completely right. Um, so, you know, somatidine was something I used to try and correct the um, the Th1 to Th2 balance, which is part of your immune system. When I was going through chemo the first time, I didn't use any metabolic therapies. I didn't uh, do any intermittent starving. I didn't, uh, you know, fast before chemo or after, which is very commonly used now. Uh, when I went through chemo the second time, I had introduced some of these supplements to try and manage some of my side effects. So I did actually cope, despite the fact initially it was a much higher dose, I, I didn't have as many side effects um, for that, that I, than I did at the, the beginning. So uh, I, I definitely feel that the metabolic therapy helped. And when it came to taking my cocktail of off-label drugs, I didn't get any side effects whatsoever. In fact, I wasn't sure anything was really happening. It was only my blood tests that were showing up that actually things were changing and I was getting better. I otherwise, you wouldn't have known I was on treatment. I didn't, you know, I didn't know I was doing as well as I, I, I was. And, you know, I was delighted. So it took seven months for my blood to completely clear from the cancer markers. And during that time, I, I honestly didn't feel any side effects whatsoever. So the bone marrow issue that I had was related to all the chemo that I'd had previously. This is something called treatment-related leukemia, and it tends to happen seven to nine years 
after your initial treatment period. This is something that we're going to see more and more because more people are surviving longer because of the treatments that people are having. And this is this is something I'm seeing more and more as well. So that this uh, treatment related leukemia um, is actually becoming much more of an issue. And it's pretty tricky to, to deal with, you know, because leukemia on its own is, is, is bad enough, but actually treatment related leukemia has a zero uh, survival rate. So, you know, apart from me, <laughs> uh, I'm here, but uh, essentially the, the oncology profession see it as uh, unsurvivable. Yeah, Maggie has a similar. I have brain radiation necrosis that nobody. Oh my god! Who oh, you? Everyone's like, no, let's radiate you again because nobody lives long enough to develop it. Yeah. But now they're beginning yeah. to. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. A lot of your work. Yeah, totally think that that's a new era that we're entering into is people yeah. surviving cancer treatments and the treatments yeah. themselves causing some other exactly really, exactly really bad, and they don't ex- really bad because they don't expect you to survive yeah. they don't expect you to get these issues i mean you know my my oncologist was quite clear that the doses of chemo that she was giving me would would possibly kill me um so she didn't expect me to survive as long as i i did um nobody did yeah. <laughs> yeah. you telling your story that you did i think is what most people need to say well hey jane did it maybe i can do yeah. it yeah if one person can do it then somebody else can do it you know it's that that the, the knowledge that it is possible is so empowering and i think people need to grasp that education to know that it is uh, entirely possible to, to survive stage four. So many people are told that's the end of the road and I seriously do not think it is. Some people have so much damage in their liver and their organs that yeah, it's very hard to come back from that. But I think just writing everybody off because they're stage four is, is an entirely wrong concept because they're not understanding that the cancer needs to be blocked on a metabolic level. And if you look at the cancers that are curable, like leukemias for kids, they are using metabolic therapy. They started using asparaginase back in the 1990s. And once they added that, they suddenly shot up from about 20% survival rate to about 90% survival rate. And that just shows you the addition of metabolic therapies is critical for us to actually achieve cures. There's overlap with so many different diseases. They are all, you know, essentially so many of them have got a metabolic basis that, you know, you start sorting out one problem and you're actually sorting out other problems at the same time, like diabetes or, you know, many of the other uh, issues and cardiovascular disease as well. So you're kind of hitting multiple diseases concurrently, which is is terrific because, you know, let's, let's face it, we all want to live a little bit longer. <laughs> and healthier there's no point living longer if we're not going to be healthy at the same time so i think it's really important to get a cocktail that's actually going to address all the different metabolic aspects but i think when you're in that stage three stage four level you actually need a pretty comprehensive cocktail of things in order to to block enough pathways to shut the cancer down um and that's something i'm looking at trying to work out uh, with an app. I'm trying to gather as much data from as many people as possible. So that's in the pipeline to try and uh, work out exactly what cocktails are the most effective for the different phenotypes of cancer, for the different mutations that you get within that so that, you know, I can provide people with much more relevant data in the future, hopefully, fingers crossed. And we need to have the data. We do need to gather enough data to work out what really does work because there's there's still disagreement about diets. There's still disagreements about, you know, which cocktails of drugs work best for different cancers. We, we want to work out what those are. And I think the data collection will be incredibly important moving forward just to try and evaluate all of that. One of the things I really stress when you have cancer is that you need to educate yourself. It's utterly important that you understand how your cancer is feeding, how it's actually growing. And that's why I have my book, my online course, because that's so important for the cancer patient to understand. The oncologist currently doesn't understand it. So it's up to the patient to get that information and to learn all of these uh, 
routes that they can use. There are so many treatment options out there. And I think it's an exciting time that we're going into at the moment with uh, metabolic therapy starting to become more accepted by the mainstream. And I seriously suggest people do their homework. It is utterly, utterly essential. Back in my day, we didn't have the internet properly. Well, fledgling internet and we also had no Facebook, nothing like that, no internet chat rooms. The information that I got was from libraries in hospitals. I would get magazines. I got Life Extension magazine. I got all the the you know really good journals that I could lay my hands on. I was I was looking for information anywhere I could. Um, but it was incredibly hard back then. But nowadays you've got so many different options, uh, so many different uh, people out there willing to teach you and to guide you. Um, but it's trying to sift through who's giving you what information and why, what might be the most suitable option for your cancer. It can still be very confusing. So people need to do their research. And you, there is always that gut instinct about what is right for you. You still have to rely on that. Uh, you, you need to do the research, but ultimately you have to feel comfortable that something that you're trying is going to work. Um, and you can't know that unless you've done the research and gained the knowledge about that treatment. Hi, my name is Jane McClelland. I am a cancer survivor and I've written a book called How to Starve Cancer, which um, it shows my journey from when I was first diagnosed to how I discovered off-label drugs and supplements. And these are all about cutting off and stopping the metabolic pathways to cancer. So I've been dealing with cancer now since 1994. Uh, so that's an awfully long time to have been dealing with cancer and, and stage four from 1999. So that's uh, over 20 years now that I've actually been dealing with stage four and I haven't had a recurrence. I've had no evidence of cancer since 2004. I've been touch wood, 100% clear since then. So it's been uh, a huge relief. <laughs> So right now I'd say that uh, I, I'm feeling great and I still take my cocktail occasionally. Uh, nighttime I will still take a satin, I still take dipridamol occasionally. So that's part of my cocktail still, metformin. I will still take during, uh, that's pretty been pretty standard off and on. Uh, I alternate it a little bit with berberine. They both do very similar things, not completely the same. And so I alternate those a little bit. I take aspirin occasionally as well. I seriously don't have any side effects from doing any of that at all and I'm I'm sure it's helped keep me healthier and the fact that I also have cystic fibrosis as well and I haven't suffered as badly as most people with my condition I am quite sure that some of the things that I've been doing for my cancer have really helped with that diagnosis as well so I'm, I'm delighted because I've actually managed to reverse some of the fibrosis that I was getting in my lungs um, so I'm, I'm really delighted by that too.